Hey, one more time. Can we just put our hands together for first time guests and our online community? Can we put our hands together one more time? Hey, I'm, um, I'm done shouting out. I'm going to bring the word. How does that sound? Are you good with that? If you are taking notes, if you are taking notes, which I would encourage you, if you're not, just get your phone out. There's this really cool app. It's called the Notes app on your phone. Um, we live in the 21st century now, so if you don't have pen and paper, you're in good company. If you have a cell phone, you can take some notes. So if you're taking notes, you can entitle this message, Triumph in Transition. Triumph in Transition. Let's pray, then we'll hop into our conversation. Lord, thank you for these moments that we get to share together. God, we're thankful for this community. Lord, we're grateful for a space that we can encounter you, that we can discover more of you, that we can know you. God, we're thankful for this place that we can come and have fun with our friends, that we can enjoy the company of the person on our left and on our right. Lord, we lift each other up in this moment, and we're grateful that you're going to speak to each of us in a real and profound way tonight. We give you glory, we give you honor, and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Everyone who agrees with us, said, amen. amen, amen. Hey, do we have any basketball players in the room? Quick show of hands. Basketball players. Okay, so we got a few. A um, few basketball players. Nice. Raise your hand if you are familiar with the sport of basketball. Okay, this is good. This is a really good start. Now, I'm just going to ask for some really honest participation. Please raise your hand if you have never watched a game and you do not care at all about basketball. I love and respect and admire your authenticity. This is great. Now, for a moment, I'm just going to talk to you. If you're in here and you're like, I don't give a rip who Michael Jordan is or LeBron James. Can I just say for a moment, though, LeBron's from Akron, so we got to give some honor there. Come on now. LBJ, this is his home. This is his home, his stomping grounds. So if you ever just don't know what to say, if you ever don't know what to say about basketball and you find yourself in a conversation, just say, I'm from Akron, <laughs> LBJ. That's all you guys say. So basketball, I'm going to give you like the easiest explanation for basketball. Are you ready? For those of you who know what basketball is, you've watched it, you're familiar with it, this is going to be pretty simple. But for those of you who don't know, this is the simple definition of basketball. There are two teams that play. The goal is to score the most points by the, by the time that the clock strikes zero in the fourth quarter. Even saying it out loud, it sounds sad. <laughs> That's what people get excited about. That's basketball in a nutshell. Now, here's the thing. Basketball is a great sport. I love basketball. Some of y'all are basketball fans. Come on, somebody, if you love basketball. I'm a hooper. I played basketball. Now, here's what you got to know about basketball. There are a lot of different methods you can use to win the game. So it is way more than just two teams trying to score the most points. I was underselling that a little bit. But to make it simple, that's really what basketball is. It is this ball. You got to get it in the hoop. And you got to do it more times than the other team. And that's about it. But in basketball, there are a lot of different methods you can use. When I was in high school and I played, I played basketball. And my team was vertically challenged, you could say. To put it lightly. Um, vertically challenged means we were not that tall. <laughs> if you're wondering what that terminology means, we weren't that tall. But we made up for it in speed. Come on now. We made up for it in speed. Did we have a little man complex at times? Maybe. We got a little upset whenever teams would try and take advantage of it and exploit our weakness and, and play down in the post the entire game. Yeah, it was frustrating. But here's what you need to know about our team. We won a lot of games by winning the transition battle. I'm going to explain this to you for a minute. For those of you who don't understand basketball, for those of you who do, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The idea of winning the battle in transition is that when I'm on offense and the defense gets the ball back, whether we score or they take the ball from us, the idea in mind is that when you win the transition battle, you have like 10 to 15 seconds tops, maybe even less to get down to the other end of the court before the other team can set up their defense and score. 
So a lot of times when you win the transition battle, even if you're not bigger or stronger, when you win in transition, you can win games. And we won games in high school that we had no business winning. And I just tell you, we had no business winning some of the games that we did, but we won because we won the battle in transition. Now hear me, you can hold on to that for a minute, but it's not yours, I'm so sorry. She's like, I don't want it anyway. (laughs) Hear me, transition can be difficult for all of us. And some of you are in transition right now. Some of you are in a season of transition, whether you're transitioning to a new grade, maybe some of you are transitioning to a new school, Maybe some of you are coming into your senior year and you're thinking about the transition from high school to college. I don't know what it is for you, but here's what I found. Transition can be hard. Transition can be challenging. And transition can bring different emotions, different challenges, different circumstances. Transition can be hard. Can we all just agree for a moment that transition can be hard? And whether you're there right now or not, can I just encourage you that you can win the battle in transition. You can win the battle in transition. Much like basketball in the game of basketball, We are called, I believe, by God that in seasons of transition, we are called to go on the offensive end, not just on the defensive end. Can I encourage some of you? Tonight, you're on the defensive end. You're cowering because you're nervous about what's going to happen next. But I want to encourage you tonight that you can win in transition. And even in this season of your life, that things may be changing. There may be some anxiety. Can I just tell you, you can win in transition. And God has something great for you this school year. This can be your best year yet. Do you believe that? This can be your best year yet? Because there are so many great things that can happen in transition. It's in transition that we can maximize new opportunity. It's in transition that new things are pulled out in us. It's in transition that we discover new things about ourselves. It's in transition that we discover new things about our God. There's something about transition. And can I just tell you that if you find yourself in a season of transition tonight, God is preparing you for something great. He's preparing you for something great. And I want to talk about it for a moment. Because again, like I said, I know that transition can be hard, challenging, difficult for all of us. But I believe there are some biblical examples that we can look at that will help us make sense of transition, but not only make sense of it, but maximize moments of transition in your life and in mine. So here are a couple of those examples. The first one is Joshua. Joshua. Joshua's transition. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 31 verses seven through eight. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel, be strong and courageous for you must go with this people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Doesn't that sound good to some of us in this room that he will never leave you? He'll never forsake you. He'll be with you. Can I encourage you that in this moment, in this season of transition for you, he is with you. He's with you. This is good news. He won't forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. So here's the story. Moses who led Israel for decades. His successor, Joshua, is about to assume the position of leadership over the tribe of Israel as they are about to step into the promised land. So he comes into a very unique situation and he steps into a role of leadership that in the eyes of most would be really, really weighty. It's not easy to lead a whole nation especially when you're following after Moses. Moses led this community for decades, and now Joshua is tasked with carrying out the mission and seeing it through, leading the Israelites to the promise. Moses got them all the way there, and now Joshua is tasked with the assignment of taking them into the promise. Here's what it says in Deuteronomy 34, 5 through 9. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said, 
He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Moses was 120 years old when he died. Someone talk about longevity, 120 years. Who's speaking 120 years over their life? I'm speaking 120 over mine. Yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses had laid his hands on him. He was filled with the spirit of wisdom. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Joshua 1, 6 through 9. We're almost through it. Joshua 1, 6 through 9. Be strong and courageous. Does that sound familiar? Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then, everyone say then. Everyone say then. Yeah. Say it with your chest, then. Yeah. A little louder, then. Yeah. That's better. Then. Meaning that what's going to happen next can only take place because of what happened before it. Are you following me? Anywhere you find a then or a therefore means that you got to go back to the thing that was just said because whatever's about to be said can only happen if what was previously said comes to pass. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that in a moment. Hold on to that for a sec. Keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Do you want to have success in your life? Raise your hand if you want to have success in your life. Okay. I would say that's at least 99.9% .9 of everyone in the room. Raise your hand if you want to be prosperous. You want your life to prosper. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. <laughs> that's number four. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Jesus' transition, number two. I'm going to give you three different examples of transition in the Bible. And then we're going to unpack them together. Jesus' transition. In Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, here's what it says. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. In this text right here, Jesus is entering into his three-year earthly ministry. So before this moment, Jesus performed no great work. There was not a great work according to scripture. There might have been things, it wasn't recorded, so we wouldn't know. But according to what we do know, it's more likely that this is the initiation of Jesus and his earthly reign here on the earth. The kingdom of God coming to the earth. Jesus Christ assuming his role. This is the transition from his time of preparation to active ministry, where Jesus would perform signs and wonders and miracles and do miraculous things and draw men unto himself. The coming kingdom of God came through Jesus Christ. This was the moment of transition for him when everything changed. And Jesus now steps in in triumph. He steps into his place as the son of God. What I love most about this text is that it says that God was well pleased with him before he ever did a great work. <laughs> Jesus did no great work according to scripture before this. But what did the Lord say? That's my son in whom I am well pleased. Can I just tell you, 
no matter how much you do for God, no matter how hard you work for him, no matter how much time you spend in his word, those are all great things. It's great to have a work ethic. It's great to partner with God and do something special with your life. But can I just tell you, he is pleased with you right here, right now. And you can't make him be more pleased with you. You can't add admiration to his eyes for you. It is right now in this very moment, he sees you with eyes of favor right where you are. Are. Isn't that good news that no matter what we do for God, he is already pleased with us. He's already pleased with you. He's already pleased with me. And yes, we want to partner with God and make a kingdom-sized impact in this world. And we want, we want to partner with him and do great things. But before Jesus ever did any great work, the father said, I'm pleased with him. That's my son. Paul's transition, number three, last one. Follow me. You guys good? We're almost there. Number three, Paul's transition. It says this in Acts 9, verses 17 through 19. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna pause for a moment. You have to understand this about Saul. Paul's original name was Saul. Saul was a killer of Christians. He did not just mock them, he killed them. He was a persecutor of followers of Christ. And he has an encounter on a road to Damascus. He has an encounter with Jesus. And the scripture says that when he had this encounter with God, he became blind, but he was given an instruction to go and find someone in the city ahead of him. This is Ananias, and Ananias had an instruction to find Saul, and here's what it says. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Saul to Paul. God would give him a new name. He would no longer be called Saul. He would be called Paul. This moment of transition in the life of Saul led to over two-thirds of the New Testament that you and I read today. Paul is responsible for over two-thirds of the New Testament being written. So can I just tell you, no matter where you are, no matter what roads you are on, our God will chase you down and meet you right where you are. And maybe tonight, this is the night that you need to know our God sees you. He understands your pain. He knows everything you've done, but he wants to pick you up, clean you up, dust you off, and give you a new name. And he already calls you son and daughter, regardless of what you've done, the mistakes that you've made. This is Saul's transition. Are you following the pattern? There are profound things that happen in transition. But what do we know about transition from these stories? Here's the first thing. It's that strength and courage are an instruction, not a suggestion. Strength and courage are an instruction, not a suggestion. Strength and courage... They're not an option. They are a command. Through transition, we must have strength and courage. The Lord tells Joshua four times to be strong and courageous. You might be thinking to yourself, this does not align with how I feel right now. You might be saying, be strong and courageous, but I don't feel strong and courageous. Can I just encourage you? Why do you think God would say it four times if he didn't know that Joshua needed to hear it four times? You might hear something from God once. You might hear it from him twice. You might hear it from him three times. You might hear it from him four times. He will keep instructing you because he knows exactly where you are. Joshua was dealing with a little bit of fear. This is why the Lord, he instructed him four times, be strong and courageous. You might be thinking to yourself, yeah, that's a nice axiom, but I don't feel strong and courageous. So is the Lord just telling me to figure it out on my own? Just be strong, be courageous? I don't believe that's what he was saying. 
I don't believe God's instruction was just figure it out, align your heart, lift weights enough so that you're strong enough. I don't believe that was his instruction, even though a lot of us really wish that was true. (laughs) Can I just pump some iron and get some strength? Some of y'all are like, I'm liking this preaching now. Come on now. You're telling me I can do some curls and get some of that strength? No. Be strong and courageous. Here's what's interesting. He's not saying figure it out. The good news for you and I is that he gave us the means to the end in the text. We'll go back to it. It says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. We're going back to this text because right after it, he says it again, be strong and courageous. It sounds really pretty, be strong and courageous, but how do I actually live that out? How do I really find this strength and courage Knowing that when I go back to school, I'm going to be faced with discouragement. I'm going to be faced with mockers. I'm going to encounter people that bully me at school. How can I really have strength and courage when I know that's what I'm facing? The Lord makes it so simple. Don't let this book of the law depart from you. Meditate on it day and day night. The antidote and the key to growing in strength and courage in this season of your life, as you prepare for school, as you prepare for that new school you're going to, as you prepare for this new grade, as you prepare for new social circles, because some of your friends moved away and now you're trying to redefine your friends, as you step into this next season, can I just tell you that the way you're gonna find courage and strength is through the word of God. It is your daily bread, your daily sustenance, your daily nourishment. It is my strength for every day. And there's no getting around it. Do you want to be strong and courageous? Do you want to be on the offensive end through this transition in your life? Grow a hunger for his word. Grow a hunger for his word. Because his word is life. And his word, according to Psalms 119, is light. For some of you, you're looking for direction. Can I just tell you that Psalm 119 says that his word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, meaning that this book. It is more than just an ancient book. This is not just a book that's going to collect some dust on our shelf. This book is life and it is light. And this book will give you the strength, the courage, and the nourishment that you need every single day. Things got different in my walk with God the moment that his word became real to me. Can I just tell you, things changed in my walk with him. I walked with courage, boldness, and strength the moment his word would not depart from my lips. The moment his word, the moment his word became my strength, the moment that his word became my security, more than just lifting and thinking that I could make myself stronger, more than trying to build myself up, my self-image up, more than trying to protect my personal security, my popularity by acting cool, more than more than the efforts that I made in the gym to try and get big because I wanted people to approve of me. Can we be really honest for a moment? Can we be really real? You will never find strength trying to add value to your personal well-being in and of yourself. You will never add enough value. You'll never be big enough. You'll never be strong enough. You'll never be smart enough to fill that God-sized gap in your heart that only Jesus and his word can fill. It is only ever Jesus, and he can fill that void, and he can fill that gap. And no matter how many times you try and cover it up with masculinity and strength and lifting weight, in popularity, in being pretty. Can I just tell you, he values you right where you are. And you don't have to try and meet the expectations of the people around you. You can just be fully secure in who you are right now. 
in this season in who he's made you to be. And you can draw your strength and your security from this book right here. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Number two, God never leaves us. So again, what happens during transition? What can we learn from these stories? It's that God never leaves us. In fact, I would say it this way, God's omnipresence, which means his, he's always present, he's always here. God's omnipresence, his presence in your life, his presence in my life is not a possibility, it's a promise. God's omnipresence, we have to shift this in our thinking. If you think that God's omnipresence, God being here, he being everywhere, is just kind of a possibility depending on how I'm doing or where I'm at, you are always going to be missing out because God has never left you. He has never forsaken you. And even when your eyes haven't been on him, his eyes have been all over you. This is the promise of his presence. He never leaves us. So even when we're discouraged, even when we're going through transition, even when we're going to a new school, even when you're stepping out to try and build some new friendships, even when you're trying to redefine your social circle, he will never leave you. And you'll never leave me. We have a promise of his presence. He never leaves us. Number three, through transition, what are we observing from these, from these stories? It's number three, there's a grace that's placed upon us. In transition, there's a grace placed on you and me. There's a grace placed. Because did you notice that in each of those stories, the Spirit of God filled each man? Did you catch that? That for Joshua, he was filled with the Spirit. That for Jesus, he was filled with the Spirit. That for Paul, he was filled with the Spirit. There is a grace on your life for this season of your life. And you may not be able to describe it. You may not be able to articulate it. You may not be able to define what you're feeling. But can I just tell you, there is a grace, a supernatural strength on your life. In transition, God gives us a grace. Aren't you grateful that you don't have to do it all on your own? Aren't you thankful that in every transition there is a grace on your life and on my life? There's a grace on you that you can't earn, you can't achieve, you can't work for. There's a grace on your life. Last one, number four. Number four, our people stand beside us. Through transition, our people stand beside us. You cannot maximize the opportunities and moments through transition on your own. Hear me. You are not designed by God, purposed by God. You are not intended by God to do it on your own. Did you notice that in each of those stories, there was a man beside them? In each of those stories, Joshua had Moses. Jesus had John the Baptist, and Paul had Ananias. There was someone standing alongside them through these moments of transition. You are not alone. You're not alone. And you are not built to do it alone. So if you really believe that you can, that you're capable, that you're able, you might be able to for a little while, but eventually it's going to catch up with you because you are only capable and you are only able to go where God's taking you when you go with others. You can't blaze your own trail to get where God wants to take you. Look throughout scripture. You can find example after example after example. Yes, he did great things through individuals, but those individuals always had support. Those individuals were never alone. They were never standing in isolation. They were always surrounded by, accompanied by support. Can I tell you in this season, here is our prayer for you, that you would find support, that you would find backing, that you would find people to lift up your arms, just like Aaron and her did for Moses in the wilderness. I believe and we believe that in this season of your life, you are going to find the right friends, you're going to find the right relationships, and God is going to bring you the right people to stand beside you. We all need the right people. Can we just be really honest? Life can feel very lonely at times. And 
when we're going through transition, it's easy to feel like we're on an island. But it is very clear, according to scripture, that we are never meant to go through transition alone. There's a people that God has called you to do life with in this season. There are people probably in this room right now that are going to be the support that will be the wind in your sails, the wind underneath your wings to help you to see this thing through. You and I are not built by God to do life alone. This is why I love connect groups. This is why I'm passionate about this space and this community because we all need what happens in this room. We all need people that believe in us. There are enough critics. There are enough doubters. There are enough opposers. We need some people that are going to stand on the front lines with us, lift up our arms, help us to see the best in this season. There are some people in this room that want to help you to see the best in this season of your life. And there are some people alongside you right now that want to call out the best in you, even when you don't see the best in yourself. God has called us to do life together.